Why has leftism become such a rooted ideology in the West? Why has it infiltrated and subverted almost all aspects of our society from Hollywood and pop culture to mainstream media to our universities? I remember specifically asking myself that same question one day a couple of summers ago when German leftists were protesting capitalism. Now, leftists protesting capitalism isn't unusual, but the reason this day is seared in my mind is because that same day that leftist Germans living in a capitalist country were violently protesting against capitalism, Venezuelans living in a socialist country were violently protesting against socialism. And the insanity of that paradox was that capitalism afforded the German anti-capitalism protesters everything from smartphones to fashionable clothes to a comfortable home to endless choices of places to purchase good, affordable food to life opportunities most people on the planet can only dream about. While the anti-socialism Venezuelan protesters who were actually living under socialism were protesting because they had none of those things. And I thought if those desperate Venezuelans protesting against socialism were aware of the Germans protesting against capitalism in Germany that day, they would have shaken their heads and seen them as spoiled know-nothing brats. And since recent surveys in the U.S. show that millennials prefer socialism over capitalism, I'd say spoiled, know-nothing brats is pretty spot-on for a whole lot of people in the West, as well as willfully obtuse. Now, there isn't just one reason that someone in a first-world Western country buys into leftism, but I've noticed that all of the reasons stem from rejecting the traditional wisdom of our past. And by traditional wisdom of our past, I mean upholding societal norms and values and our cultural and societal understanding that there's a way things are, there's a way we do things, and it works, so let's do it that way. And traditional wisdom in raising children went out the window with the self-esteem movement. And I think that's a good place to start in answering why Westerners are now so attracted to socialism. FYI, the self-esteem movement is the nationwide effort to make all children feel special, whether in the classroom or on the ball field. And not just special, and I know this doesn't make a lot of sense, but also equal by engulfing them in a world where there is no competition and there are no winners or losers. The premise of the self-esteem movement is that since successful people have high self-esteem, if we teach self-esteem, we'll get successful people. But that's not how it works. Traditional wisdom says self-esteem has to be earned, like confidence comes through developing your abilities. So I would say successful people have high self-esteem because they are successful, not the other way around. And I have to mention that in my book, you don't have to be a millionaire CEO to be a successful person. A successful person is a responsible, self-reliant adult of good character. When you praise children lavishly for easy things, why should that make them want to do hard things? Psychology professor Carol Dweck of Columbia University recently published findings that show that the kind of praise found in self-esteem courses may actually hurt children's performance. She repeated her experiment for us. Fifth graders are given an easy puzzle to solve, then told how smart they are. That's a really good score. You must be smart at these problems. <laughs> you must be really smart at these problems. Another group isn't told that they're smart, only that they tried hard. Right. That's a really high score. You must have worked hard on these problems. So you must have worked hard on these problems. Then both groups are given a much harder test. Everyone does poorly on that. You only got one of those right, which isn't as good as last time. What happens next is surprising. The kids are asked to take more tests. Kids who were praised for trying, like Cody, are eager to try more. Some actually asked to take work home. But those who were told they are smart were reluctant to face further challenges. They could not handle setbacks. That's why not to tell Johnny he's brilliant. It gets him caught up in being brilliant rather than learning. 
Kids need honest feedback, say Dweck and others. Can you count by nice? Yes! Do and they so? need to learn that excellence comes from effort. If you're never told what your weaknesses are, how will you improve on them? Protecting kids from failure, they say, is the worst sort of false kindness. Perhaps the most unexpected bad news about the self-esteem movement is that some experts say it may actually be dangerous. For years we've been told that kids in trouble suffer from low self-esteem. It's a concept used to try to make sense of the horrible school shooting sprees of the past year. But new research suggests the self-esteem advocates have it backwards. Violence may be the result of artificially high self-esteem. People who have this inflated, grandiose view of themselves, when other people criticize them, uh, they, they're likely to, to lash out and become angry and aggressive. So then, you don't get successful people when kids are never criticized and when praise is not tied with performance. You get entitled narcissists who can't perform normally in the real world. And when you shatter the delusion of grandeur of someone who thinks the world revolves around them by challenging their worldview, they not only get nasty, but resentful. One of the worst emotional states. And guess what that opens them up to? The ideology of resentment, leftism, socialism. And that ideology will reaffirm everything they learn from the self-esteem movement that they're special and unique snowflakes and that if they fail at something it's someone else's fault because there aren't supposed to be any losers because in today's america no child ever loses there are no losers anymore everyone's a winner no matter what the game or sport or competition everybody wins everybody wins everybody gets a trophy no one is a loser. No child these days ever gets to hear those all-important character-building words. You lost, Bobby. <laughs> you lost. You're a loser, Bobby. They miss out on that. You know what they tell a kid who lost these days? You were the last winner. <laughs> a lot of these kids never get to hear the truth about themselves until they're in their 20s. When their boss calls them in and says, Bobby, clean the shit out of your desk and get the fuck out of here, you're a loser. Get the fuck out of here. You know? Now, another thing that's conditioning kids to be leftists is the introduction of neo-Marxism into our education system. As early as grade school, kids are taught the virtues of multiculturalism, cultural relativism, and internationalism instead of nationalism. And everyone's taught about the Nazi atrocities in high school, but how many kids are taught about the Ukrainian famine which killed 6 to 7 million, and that was the direct result of socialism? And when it comes to higher learning, how many colleges even offer courses about Marxist philosophy in practice? And by that I mean that show the devastating effects of socialism everywhere it's been tried. Like the devastating effect of the Bolshevik Revolution for the Russian people. Or that Pol Pot was an entitled son of a wealthy farmer in Cambodia who adopted Marxism when he joined the French Communist Party while in college in Paris, then returned to Cambodia and eventually became leader of the Marxist-Leninist-inspired rebels, and, by the way, was praised all the while by the socialist elite in France which is reminiscent of when idiots like Bernie Sanders, Michael Moore, Sean Penn, and uh, many others praised Hugo Chavez for imposing socialism in Venezuela. So then, as leader of the Kumar Rouge, a.k.a. the Cambodian left, the killing fields happened. Pol Pot killed millions, literally about 30% of the Cambodian population, trying to create an agrarian socialist society. How many leftist professors talk about that? And don't get me started on the 38 other countries where socialism has been tried. And so when kids aren't encouraged to think for themselves like in most universities today, they don't even consider the basics like you don't judge the morality of a system based on the sales pitch, but on the results. 
and their lack of thinking for themselves is why so many millennials don't even consider that when you add the human factor to from each according to his abilities to each according to their needs, it becomes contribute as little as possible, take as much as you can, which is summed up in an old Soviet joke. They pretend to pay us, we pretend to work. And then they don't get that because capitalism requires property rights, it makes your labor your property, which you're free to sell to the highest bidder. In a socialist system where private property and profit is illegal, you're reduced to a slave. So then, to sum it up, another reason idealistic Western millennials are attracted to socialism is not only have they never experienced it, they've never really thought about it or been taught about it. And what they have been taught, they've been taught by Marxist professors. And that's why a Che Guevara or a hammer and sickle shirt is edgy and cool to them. They have no clue what it really represents. Fast forward, you get your PhD in economics at Indiana. You become a professor of eventually here at Auburn. Uh, what do you think of the American kids you teach, the undergrads? I know you teach macro and money and banking. What's your impression of them? Do they understand uh, capitalism? Do they understand communism? Do they have a sense of how lucky they are? Uh, most of them don't, and that's what I'm trying to change a little bit. So I tell them stories from the Soviet Union, and uh, my experience, and I teach over 500 undergraduate mm -hmm. students every year, so large okay. sections. And I try to talk to them, which I think is very shocking to them because they don't expect this from a professor in a large uh, section. So they expect someone to come, read off PowerPoints, and then they don't expect the professor walk around and ask them questions and like, hey, what do you guys think? And especially if I give them examples from Soviet Union, and I was like, why do you think there wasn't a production of chewing gum in Ukraine when I talked about, you know, different markets, a different economic system? And they... So they kind of taken it back a little bit. Mm -hmm. So it takes them a while to start, you know, talking back to me. Uh, but what I find is that most of them um, just take everything for granted and, uh, and they don't realize how lucky they are. We were talking off camera um, that in your childhood, you thought of yourself as a Russian citizen not a as Soviet. A, a Soviet citizen, not as a Ukrainian, whereas in the United States, there, people have an identity based on Texas or where they're from, and that you felt that the Soviet Union in, in, would have discouraged any sort of Ukrainian nationalism. Yes, they try. I think that's one of the things that they try to do is just kind of discourage um, all these 15 republics from keeping their identity, national identity, mm -hmm. so everybody was a Soviet citizen. So they tried to equalize everybody. So we all equal, we are all Soviet citizens. So there was no Ukrainian identity or Moldovan or Belarusian. So we are mm -hmm. all the citizens of the Soviet Union. So I think in that way, they kind of tried to uh, keep the masses in, under control, I guess, okay. you know, so that you don't identify with something else. So you are all citizens of the Soviet Union. And but I did get some comments saying that, you know, oh, she just makes up these scary stories about growing up in the Soviet Union. Wow. Um, like I told them, you know, about socialized health care. And I said that, uh, well, raise your hand if you want to have a root canal done without any anesthetic. And they were like, oh, what? I said, well, I had it done. And they like, you know, some people wouldn't believe it. And I said, I know it's hard to believe. And then, but those who smart they would say like they would ask questions like why couldn't you have any anesthetic i said because the government decided who gets anesthetic they were rationed and only people uh got painkillers and anesthetics for major surgeries like heart surgeries abdominal surgeries there was no painkillers used in dental care whatsoever in the soviet union i said here you go to the dentist some people have different sensitivity levels if you need to get two shots, you pay money and they give you, they numb your mouth for three days. You won't feel anything. In the Soviet Union, you did not have the choice. So I tell them it was like an execution camera. You know, you come like medieval execution. I said, I finally overcame fears of dentists here. And it took me like five years. I was just panically afraid of the dentist. So some of them say I made it up and it never happened. You know, and stories like that. So they don't 
they don't believe but most of them will believe it and they you know they would be like wow we never knew this was going on you know a lot of them just completely detached from reality i think and they are not prepared to deal with any kind of emotional stress or anything like that so they they just they break down like anything it's like i even make jokes in my class i was like everybody is offended by any, by everything nowadays i say you know you can't even say anything you can say merry christmas you can say this it's, it's ridiculous and i tell people my relatives you know died in siberian camps you think i care you get offended by something i say just like to me it's it's very it's ridiculous but uh it's true a lot of them are just so fragile that and uh, they can't handle any real life serious situation i think so i am not surprised by the fact that they favor socialism because they think since they are not capable of dealing with anything they just think of someone else should take care of their problem Polish capitalism what are you going to replace it with i wonder socialism, socialism. really yeah. and what do you think is going to happen under socialism well we wouldn't have people unemployed really we wouldn't have people no hungry. kidding we, no kidding we wouldn't have five percent of the world's population really five percent what's the prison. difference between north korea and south korea i wonder people in north korea. what's the difference between north korea and south korea the workers in north korea get yeah. paid get paid Decent. Really? Yeah. Really? And nobody imprisons them, nobody kills them, they're not dying from hunger, no. they do not resort to cannibalism, and people in South of Korea... Never heard of it. Really? Were you surprised that she made no sense whatsoever when she tried to persuade you that somehow people, whether they work for the government or not, are better paid, better fed, and better housed in North Korea than in South Korea? Well, I guess it wasn't that shocking. I, unfortunately, I did come across people like that before, but it was so shocking that it was so ignorant to claim that North Korea is better than South Korea. This is the best example that illustrates the difference between capitalism and uh, dictatorship or socialism. Well, well, my father had to sell illegal meat out of his ambulance in Cuba because the government wouldn't pay him enough. I mean, Cuban doctors earn like less than 1% than American doctors. You don't see any future. Everything is stagnated. Healthcare, education, yeah. nowadays they're in ruins. I tell the Venezuela, my Venezuelan friends, we warned you guys. Why did you leave your country? It's like the apocalypse. It's no food, no medicine. How do you feel when you see other countries with the same mistakes that Cuba has made for the past decades? Terrible. Michelle Ibarra escaped Cuba and says Venezuela should have learned from Cuba's failure. People in other countries in Latin America, they will blame anything else besides socialism. What would you say to the Americans that like the idea of socialism and support it here? I would say that they should wake up. You don't need the government to dictate how, you're, how to live your life, uh, how much money you should make, how your family should be uh, treated or how much you should pay. If anything, I think taxes are still a bit high here, but um, it's the best we have in the entire world. 19th century German philosopher Nietzsche talked about something he called the master and slave morality. And I think it relates to this topic and is at worst some food for thought. In Nietzsche's view, the master morality is the yes-saying attitude and represents the strong, the free, the go-getters, the vigorous, the self-reliant, the purposeful, the assertive, the explorers, the risk-takers, the brave, the open-minded, the truthful, the trusting. And the master morality judges itself and determines its own values and does not need approval. On the other hand, the slave morality, or herd morality, is the naysaying attitude and is the morality of the weak, those who feel victimized, the passive, those who are afraid of risks and self-reliance. Unlike the master morality, the slave morality cannot set its own values, so they require flattery, a good opinion of themselves, and praise. The weak are afraid of the strong and envious of the strong, and they not only feel frustrated, but secretly hate themselves. And because of this self-hatred, the weak develop a rationalization that tells them that they are morally superior because they are on the side of the weak 
humble, passive, victimized, oppressed people who they see as like themselves. And so then the strong, the aggressive, the assertive, the independent, the physically and materially successful become the enemy. The weak feel such hatred and resentment that he'll feel compelled to lash out. And because physical confrontations isn't typically feasible for the weak, they use what weapons they can, like words. Hate leads to the compulsion to destroy, so the words don't have to be true or logical, because their purpose is only to deconstruct, to destroy what the strong have constructed. Like a child who can't build a sandcastle himself, who then destroys the sandcastle of a child who can. This is the only way they know how to achieve equality. Western civilization and capitalism represents the strong. And to destroy it, they attack the West's sense of its own morality the pride people have in its achievements, and they undermine its core principles. And like I said, the combination of resentment, bitterness, envy, rage, creates a psychological compulsion that allows them to ignore contradictions because what really matters is that they are harming their enemy, the strong. Therefore, the goal of the weak is to impose its herd morality universally. Now, Nietzsche saw the rise in the popularity of slave morality and gave reasons for why we need to abandon it. He said the problem with slave morality is that the weak, by the creativity of their resentment, seek to make everyone equal, equally weak that is. And he concluded slave morality needs to be abandoned because it's unnatural and leads to the weakening of humanity. It's simply incompatible with the natural innate drive for self-improvement that everyone has. And you see this everywhere today people choosing the ideology of victimhood over self-improvement. So to sum this up, I guess I'd say, and I know it's simplistic, but I'd say another reason why Marxist ideals are so attractive to people is because it takes away the burden of personal responsibility. And to reiterate, when someone believes every fail is someone else's fault, it brings out some of the worst elements of human nature in them like envy, resentment, and hate. And of course, leftism welcomes those elements with open arms. Now, another thing that I think contributes to the popularity of far-left ideology in the West is the collective loss of the Christian faith. And regardless of what religion you are, or if you're atheist, there's no denying that Christianity and Western civilization are deeply entwined. There's no doubt Christianity has helped shape Western culture. And personally, I'm convinced Western civilization would not even have survived the centuries of brutal aggression against Europe by Muslims starting in the 7th century had Christianity not spread throughout the kingdoms of Europe and in many ways united the kingdoms of Europe. Now, before I go any further, I want to be clear. I'm not saying being irreligious will make someone a socialist. What I am saying, though, is it will make the average person more susceptible to non-traditional doctrines like Marxism. And the Soviets understood this perfectly. And just a glance at Europe today shows that the bane of leftists and globalists are nationalists, and the overwhelming majority of nationalists identify as Christian. I'm Jim który zasłynął żądaniem wprowadzenia szariatu w Wielkiej Brytanii, powiedział Jednego dnia prawo szariatu zostanie wprowadzone także w Polsce, bo wierzymy, że należy usunąć wszystkie opresyjne reżimy. Jeśli rządzi wami ktoś inny niż Allah, to jest to forma ucisku. Dzięki naszej polityce i ten wasz reżim zostanie usunięty, a ludzie będą szczęśliwi. Tymże bez głów. Islamski mamie, tutaj nie będziecie wprowadzać żadnych swoich praw. Tutaj jest Polska, tutaj jest nasza ziemia, nasz kraj, nasze prawa i zasady. Tutaj królem jest Jezus Chrystus.
Nie interesują nas żadne dyrektywy i kwoty imigrantów, które gdzieś tam sobie przydzielacie. Powtarzam, to nie nasze wojny, nie nasza kultura, nie nasza wiara i nie nasi imigranci. Pew Research did a study last year about Christianity in Europe and found that Christian identity in Western Europe is associated with higher levels of negative sentiment towards immigrants. And non-practicing Christians are less likely than church-attending Christians to express nationalist views. Still, they are much more likely than the religiously unaffiliated to say that their culture is superior to others and that it is necessary to have the country's ancestry to share the national identity. In other words, that one must have a German family background to be German. So, to sum it up, I'm not saying identifying as Christian is necessary for having a strong sense of national identity uh, traditional Western values or necessary for being a nationalist, a patriot, right-wing, a conservative, or whatever. But I think if the collective loss of Christianity in the West continues, it will have far-reaching effects on our culture and way of life, and will contribute to the further embrace of leftist ideals. And uh, it's impossible to understand our art, our music, our architecture, if you have no understanding of Christianity. It, uh, uh, everything written by Bach was really a glorification of God. You can't uh, listen to any of the masses. You can't walk by a cathedral. You can't go into an art gallery and understand any sense of what our tradition, our history is, if you don't understand, at some level, Christianity, whether you believe it or not. So this idea that some of uh, people in the dissident movement, some of them want to turn their backs on, his, on Christianity, think that it's a universal religion that has helped poison us. Uh, uh, I think there are many Christians now who are universalists in a very dangerous way. But Christianity was part of imperialism. Christianity was uh, the religion of my ancestors who fought uh, for the Confederate state of America. Uh, I think Christianity has, it, it does have in the New Testament passages that lend itself to that kind of self-destructive universalism, but Christianity itself need not be practiced that way. And I believe Christianity has been perverted and diverted in all kinds of ways and things that are actually more powerful than religion itself. And it seems uh, for those who blame the universalism of Christianity for our current suicidal tendencies, it's odd that uh, the United States and the West have become increasingly suicidal as they have become less Christian. So it's, it's, it's difficult for me to blame Christianity. And as I say, it's so much part of our tradition, part of our culture that uh, uh, I, ha I can certainly bear no hostility towards it. And uh, I, I'm, I'm very, very comfortable in a church service. Uh, all of these things are exceedingly warm and friendly and comforting feelings for me. Wh whatever our people as uh, patriotic Europeans, whether they believe in Christianity or not. This is such a fundamental part of our culture and identity that uh, I think to, to repudiate it is, is, is very, very damaging. And um, uh, it, it, it cuts us off from so much of that's essential in our own heritage. So I've covered a few diverse topics that contribute to the popularity of socialism in the West today. But I feel like I've missed something. I've talked about how great schools teach the entitlement mentality, and that how many colleges are flat-out Marxist indoctrination camps. But schools in the Soviet Union indoctrinated their kids on the inhumanity of capitalism, yet former Soviet citizens who have come to the West generally don't want to get on the public dole. They want to participate in capitalism and they right away embrace the free market, self-reliance, and they gratefully appreciate self-determination, including the right to fail. Why? Well, not just because they've actually experienced socialism, but because they're not ignorant. And by that I mean they're not ignorant about how life works. Unlike so many in the West today, especially millennials. And we can't just blame bad schools for that. 
I'd say bad parenting is a bigger factor, and that includes the deterioration of the nuclear family and traditional family values, a pillar of Western civilization. 18 to 29, you would fit that. Uh, a majority of them in that age group back socialism over capitalism. What's your name? Morgan McGuire. Hey, Morgan. Why do you think so many young people like socialism more than capitalism? Um, probably because their dads don't teach them about capitalism like mine does. Really? What did your dad teach you? <laughs> um, that socialism is bad and you don't need to share the wealth if you're not working. Yeah, but don't you want free stuff? <laughs> no. Really? I like working for my stuff. Well, you are, you are a rare person. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. All right. So the bottom line is there's no good excuse why so many kids today in the West are ignorant about things like the fact that life isn't fair or about the value of a dollar or about the importance and benefits of giving your employer your best or about the pitfalls of debt or about the basics of capitalism like that your pay is based on your value in the marketplace, not based on what you feel your value should be or about why socialism sucks, or about personal responsibility and how that people are defined by their choices. And when you couple ignorance of how the world works with idealism, you end up with welcoming masses of people into your homeland who despise you and your culture. Or you end up hiking in a foreign country with the assumption that all cultures are equal and that if you just respect people, they'll respect you back. Or you end up buying into a utopian fantasy that's not grounded in reality because it doesn't take into account what a human being is or what makes a successful society function. Either way, things end badly. So will our civilization end badly? I don't know. Maybe we'll correct our course naturally. Maybe it'll take something more drastic. Or maybe like Rome will crumble and fall, followed by a thousand years of darkness. I don't know, but there is something we can do now that may make a difference. We can be a little less materialistic and remember what's really important in life. Also, we can pass on to our children traditional wisdom like, nothing satisfies a person that he has not earned. And most importantly, we can teach them about their heritage, about who they are, why they should be proud of their nation, history, and culture, and that tradition is not the worship of ashes, but the preservation of fire.